welcome to How to Deal When the Shit Gets Real podcast. I'm Rietta. And I'm Connie. And today we're here with Catherine Life Design. So Catherine, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you deal when the shit gets real. <laughs> oh my gosh, I want to di- dive like right in, but I think I'm going to give you some time to, to get into this. Um, yeah, so the short version is I used to be an entrepreneur for many, many years. All of a sudden, I got very ill. Three years of hell, like chronic illness, bedridden, depression, anxiety, autoimmune disease, like so many things. And uh, I thought that was it. I thought my life was going to end until I found things that really helped me through this journey. And um, I was just talking to a friend the other day, and I have been completely healthy and symptom free of 32 symptoms and diagnoses for over a year now, just over a year. Today, I apply those same tools that are used to heal me to my own business and uh, not just to my own business but I also help other entrepreneurs and basically we get rid of procrastination uh, perfectionism overwhelm and onset of chronic illness and depression and all those things so that's what I do now and that's how I got out of the shit basically and now I I love to help other people do that too um okay so what's the secret I I don't know how do you get rid of 38 symptoms (laughs) Gotta know that <laughs> right away. <laughs> yeah. Con- I was just gonna say congrats on one year of being healthy to you. That's amazing. Congratulations. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah. And and seriously, I'll shout it from the rooftops because I it's once you've gone through something like that, you cannot keep it to yourself anymore. It's like it it was this was so profound in so many ways. And again, the very simple answer to that was nervous system regulation and brain retraining and maybe that does not you know that does not uh, ring a bell yet but it should and it definitely will in the future because I now start seeing nervous system regulation teachings and education all around so people are starting to discover it and it has freaking changed my life like everything I I literally when when the shit like when the shit hit the fan let's call it like that I thought I'd lost everything. I thought I'd lost my business. I lost my friends. I'd lost my family. I lost my, you know, I was at a financial breakdown as well. I was so far beyond that breakdown anyway. (laughs) But um, literally, I, I thought I would lose my relationship. And thanks to nervous system regulation, not only did my body start to heal itself, but I was also able to repair a lot of those things. So, you know, losing relationships and being there all by yourself, that's quite tough. But What I'm trying to say is it's not just physical healing. It heals everything, like who you are. You become a completely new person, new identity. You dig into all your coping patterns, survival patterns that have kind of been ruining your life up up until now, probably. So it was just life changing. That's how I did it. So how did these symptoms come about? I know you kind of mentioned in your pre-interview that you think you suffered some abuse as a teenager. Did it go all the way back to you being like what happened to you as a teenager and you had just been holding on to that for all these years? Yeah, thanks for, for that question. So basically what happens when we experience a lot of overwhelm in our childhood and, you know, it, it, there doesn't need to be, you don't need to be thinking, oh, I've experienced huge trauma and uh, and things like that. I came out of my teens and even adulthood and even until a couple of years ago thinking yeah it wasn't so bad what happened to me like I did not realize I had trauma until I was diagnosed with CPTSD which is complex um, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder I did you know it did not occur to me that I had been traumatized but what happens when we um, in those formative years experience a lot of overwhelm our nervous system does not know what to do anymore and it, it kind of shuts down. So literally it, it dysregulates our nervous system there it, right in that moment because it wants to protect your nervous system and your limbic brain try to protect you from that overwhelm. And we only have these like three or four methods of coping with these things. The first one, everybody knows, a fight, flight, freeze or fawn so those are the four and fawn is a kind of like people pleasing um pattern so where you try to please the other person in order to secure your survival so those are the four patterns and yeah we we basically go into one of those um yeah into one of those responses 
and that gets stored for later and that, that that's trauma right there if it does if it's not processed so you end up with a very dysregulated nervous system if you've gone through a couple of those things and if you've never processed it then yes this hangs on and and stays with us as a survival pattern as a coping mechanism for example in adult life if you get you know if there's a lot of pressure on you you might respond with procrastination, which is a kind of freeze state, you know, all those kind of things. So that, that's that's basically, we never realize that even 20, 30, 50 years later, we carry around the same patterns with us. Just to, you know, jump forward a little bit and uh, to answer the question, how does chronic disease, how does chronic illness come out of all of that? Well, imagine your body goes into a freeze state for a long time, um, where, you know, th this is where chronic fatigue, burnout, all those kind of things happen, where your brain decides it's going to shut you down in order to, you know, secure your survival. And if you are in that fight, flight, freeze or fawn state for too long, your body starts to shut down all sort of non-essential functions. That's digestion, where we absorb nutri uh, nutrients. That's the immune system. That's the hormonal system for reproduction. Because first of all, we've got to survive. And then we can think about reproduction. I had loads and loads of, not loads and loads, but I had loads of miscarriages, for example. Also a sign of, you know, how dysregulated I was. Um, yeah, so this is this is the perfect breeding ground for, for other illnesses and, and diseases to take hold of you. So that's how I ended up with 32 symptoms and diagnosis. Wow. What was the first intense. symptom? The first symptom, and I didn't recognize it as a symptom uh, early on, was I didn't, I started not sleeping so well. So I would have troubles going to sleep. I would have trouble, you know, s sleeping through the night, like waking up at five o'clock in the morning every night and being tired, but not able to sleep. I would also very strongly respond to emotional triggers. Like if things weren't going the way I wanted them to go, I would, I would go into like a, no, that, you know, I would, I would really emotionally respond. And uh, as if it was about my survival, which, you know, for my out, for my, for my surroundings and people around me, they probably thought, you know, what's going on with her? She's really responding emotionally, like uh, angry and whatnot. So although I didn't have access to my anger back then so much, it was more, yeah, I was always like panicked when things didn't go the way I wanted them because that was my my coping pattern, my, my coping mechanism. Yeah. And so it makes uh, sense that sleep would be the first one because you need yeah. sleep for freaking everything and whenever my mom is, like doesn't sleep that's always when she gets sick are you open to talking about what did happen to you as a teenager and why that was just so heavy for you absolutely yes again I did not think it was that bad at the time I was like yeah you know I, I thought what I'd experienced was normal but um when I was 10, my mother remarried and unfortunately she married a narcissist who completely brainwashed her and he would then start like a smear campaign against me and like portraying me as this, this uh, revolt, uh, not revolting, but like this, um, and I'm no good for nothing child and, uh, and things like that. And my mother, by the end of it, was so brainwashed that she became, she was the enabler in the whole story and, and started to believe his stories too. So, and he would sometimes blatantly lie about what I had done. But I think one of the worst things for me personally was not feeling safe for years oh, yeah. in my own home. So I, I remember the times I was in my room and me and him, we would not talk. So he would give me typical, he would give me typical responses like the silent treatment, which is a very aggressive, passive aggressive, you know, treatment of, of a child who doesn't know what she's done wrong. He would, I mean, we lived in the same house and he wouldn't talk to me for a year. Um, oh my goodness. Yeah. I don't know how you how that's possible, you know. And I was, of course, I was trying to win his approval, but you know, it didn't really matter what I did or didn't do. I could never win anyway. It was just, you know, it was just, it was just such a dead end, really. And I remember being in my room, and then um, whenever I wanted to go to the bathroom, I I was scared to leave my room, so I would like open the door and and like look if anybody was there, and would just 
like run outside quickly go to the bathroom and then return to my right. room um so there was a lot a lot of emotional abuse that didn't look like abuse like what would i have told the you know child protection services or you know it was it yeah. wasn't serious yeah. enough but it was it was systematic manipulation it was systematic systematic like d- taking away my my sense of self and i ended up with beliefs like it's always my fault like i i can never succeed i can you know just things like that where you completely lose any confidence that you you'll get out of this um, and i was trapped there for many years and just um i i also uh, attempted suicide at 14 um, oh my goodness! But like, yeah, because I just didn't know what how to live. Like the the ah, oh, I I can't even describe it. But the 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 sense of living there had become so unbearable. Just yeah. like a giant burden whenever, almost. Yeah, and whenever we would run into each other, this might end in a shouting match, or again more silent treatment, or again him telling me. Uh, so many times how useless and awful I am so you know and this is so weird people like I always thought it's not so bad but if you think about what's the worst treatment in prison like what's your worst punishment anybody anybody want to venture a guess I would say isolation exactly it's the isolation and that's what he did like systematically isolating me my mom had broken off contact with everyone at that point I was never allowed to see friends I was never I wasn't allowed to call my grandparents so I secretly called them every two months and luckily at 14 I moved out and um, moved in with my grandparents so yeah they got me out of there (laughs) oh well thank goodness for your grandparents oh my goodness how did your I'm because I'm guessing like your mom and your stepdad when you committed or you attempted suicide I'm guessing like they just like turned it around on like you they didn't take yeah. and they were just they never knew I never told them um so oh, if I knew... okay I assumed that they yeah. knew nah. and that they would make the situation even worse is all I can <laughs> imagine <laughs> totally <laughs> that I'm sure that would have happened it was oh, you know come on <laughs> that kind of thing yeah. but uh I told my mom like maybe a couple months ago or a couple of years ago I don't know not years ago but I think uh so me and my mom we weren't in touch for the last couple of years but um yeah I've, I've started speaking about these things and I also said you know did you know I attempted suicide at 14 she was like oh no I didn't of course not yeah <laughs> so it was yeah. very it was a very Oh, the experience was very lonely in general, like going through all of yeah. this and not having anybody to talk about that. Yeah. I was gonna and ask she, you if you did finally tell your mom. So that was that was good that you finally got to yeah. release that and tell her. Did yeah. she stay with him or did they end up getting um a divorce? Did she end up like realizing that he's yeah. a huge narcissist? <laughs> Uh, she did, but far too late. Um so when I moved out at 14, I think I heard once that she cried for two years, having lost me. But you know, it's, it's, I, I felt very betrayed by her at the time. You oh, know, yeah. her job was to protect me, and she didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, in many ways, she was his first victim. She left him. I think four or five five years later, we weren't in touch for five years, or maybe four years. I think we tried a couple of times at the beginning after I'd moved out. Yeah, so she finally left him, and I think I had moved. So I I grew up in Austria. I I was born in Austria. But when she left him a month before that, I had left Austria to move to the UK to study. So there wasn't like, it took until I was like 27, 28, until I moved back to Austria where we sort of rekindled our relationship. But she was so happy. I mean, we had contact before that. She was so happy. But I didn't realize until I went through trauma therapy the last year and a half that for me, the relationship was never safe. I never realized mm-hmm. that I I do not trust her. And she was she was always like trying to in an, an emotionally or energetic way to get close to me again. But I would never let her. So don't blame was, you. Yeah, exactly. Has she <laughs> ever apologized to you for everything that she did? 
We did some like systemic, is it systematic, systemic um, therapy, like family therapy um, mm -hmm. for like one or two sessions. This is this was when I was 28, maybe. And, you know, back then I was like, yeah, you know, it was fine. And she went through the whole process of forgiving herself and also asked me for forgive, like apologize to me. And I was like, yeah, that's fine. I, I didn't know that, you know, this was going to blow up in my face 10, 20 years later, even like um, I started yeah. getting ill at 38. Yeah, I, I don't know. It, it really, the last couple of years, I broke off contact just to kind of protect myself from triggers. But uh, now I'm starting to feel much more at ease having gone through trauma therapy as well. So for, for me, it awesome. wasn't over. For her, it was <laughs> in many ways. Yeah. Yeah. But good for you that you got what you needed and you mm -hmm. went through all the therapy and everything because I can't mm -hmm. imagine how much of a burden that had to be mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I did not realize that um, trauma can make you ill so many years later. And it was it was so sad um, that even when I was 16, 17, you know, I had like circular hair loss. I started to turn gray at 26. Those are very classic signs of trauma. Nobody ever thought when I was 16 with, you know, the circular hair loss, they were like, yeah, it's psychosomatic. Okay. They gave me a little tincture to put on top so my hair would grow back. Nobody ever thought, I mean, this is my grandparents, bless them, you know, they were they're a different generation. Nobody ever thought to to, you know, start me start, get me into therapy back then. So oh, I carried yeah. this around with me for so many years. And I bet you have some experience with that as well. Uh Rietta, you, you look kind of a little bit uh yeah, not not welled up, but I was just gonna ask. <laughs> I just I love how real our guests are and how willing they are to share things that they've gone through. And I'm an empath, so I right. feel what you feel. Thank you. So, yeah. Um I also did not know that was a thing that you could get sick like that, but I mean it it totally makes sense when you really think about it. And you mentioned in your pre uh interview the lymphatic lymphatic, excuse me, coping mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So, what are those and how do that all happen so the yeah the limbic brain um sorry if this gets a little biological scientific or whatever <laughs> the limbic brain we is, like it <laughs> oh yeah great. i i'm a nerd on this now I, I never used to but the limbic brain is one of the oldest parts of our brain and it is in charge of survival so all animals uh, and reptiles have it and the limbic brain is yeah in charge of survival yeah having having babies like reproduction <laughs> um but also emotional uh like uh, emotions memory and smell so sometimes when you walk into a room and you smell something like ah oh, that reminds me of my grandparents house or something you know scent can be a very strong trigger for for emotional connections sometimes so that's what it's in charge of so you, and it's also uh it also steers the um autonomous nervous system so it's in charge of like guiding the autonomous or telling the autonomous nervous system what to do. And the autonomous nervous system, you can already tell by autonomous that it's doing, it's in charge of all the function that we don't consciously think of. Like you, know, your beating heart, your digestion, your immune system, your you know, pupils widening, um, us tensing up to, to run away from something, all those things. So when the limbic brain is impaired, again from trauma it can look something like this we have this little thing in the limbic brain called the amygdala which constantly scans are we safe are we not are we safe are we not and when it comes back with the response yeah we're safe you know we in rest and digest so we're in this relaxed <laughs> mode but if it just senses a tiny little bit of danger and if it can, like sometimes it recognizes things, oh, we've experienced this before, this is a huge danger, respond. And then it tells the nervous system again to go into fight, flight, freeze or fawn. And it's also connected to the hippocampus, which is in charge of storing memories. So the amygdala checks with the hippocampus, have we experienced this before? And if we have, and if it's been critical to our survival, like 
getting, you know, loved by our parents is super, super survival important for us when we are seven. But oh, um, yeah. so that's why a lot of people res res um, uh, respond so strongly if they feel rejected. Um, either by a partner or even you can see that on the internet when people like start commenting on each other's posts oh, yeah. and like these like yeah battles of of yeah. not feeling rejected I mean it, it, sometimes we go crazy with that because we feel that's a very strong emotion if it looks similar to something we've experienced in the past and that seemed dangerous to us back then to our limbic brain our limbic brain stores that um, and prioritizes that so that's why we have emotional outbursts um yeah like when we feel abandoned or betrayed or whatever and most people run around with a limbic brain that is probably got stuck somewhere around 10 years 8 years 15 years you know we never reparent our limbic brain and this is so curious because um, we run around like if somebody rejected me when I was seven, that was dangerous to me. But at 42, if some, you know, someone says, oh, I don't like the way you look and you're an idiot, you know, my limbic brain will still like respond like as if it was survival, our survival depended on it. And it just doesn't. So reparenting means we put this in perspective and we learn different response patterns. So in the end, there's a good example. Um, I, I, this is not political in any in any shape or form. But if Donald Trump was provoked, he would fiercely respond. Like he, I don't think yeah. his his nervous system was Absolutely. reparented. I think yeah, it was like a, a nervous system that was stuck somewhere. So and how do you do the reparenting process? How does that's one a, do that? Yeah, that's a great question. So you have two approaches. The one is called regulating your nervous system, where you realize you are having a response and you actually, you physically regulate your body. So when you are in fight, flight, freeze or fawn, there, there's a, a, like a, a somatic, it's called somatic movement. You can do certain movements that signal back to your brain, no, we are safe. You can see this when a gazelle or wh whatever gets chased by a lion and then escapes and lives, it starts to shake. So shaking is a, is, a, is a signal to the brain, we are safe. So you can interrupt the response physically. And that is fantastic. Like the first um, trauma responses that I, uh, trauma reactions that I could cope with myself when I really strongly responded to something were through physical movement, were through somatic movement. So highly recommend that. Shaking, um, there's also great uh, exercise called Wu, Wu Om, which is literally... So you you have your vagus nerve vibrate, and again, that sends a physical sim, uh, signal to your brain: we are safe. And it's not like your body or your brain can really, you know, they're like, oh no, we're not safe. You know, it's a, it's a physical signal, and the the limbic brain will respond accordingly. And the other thing is, and it will it will send you more into rest and digest again into the calm state. And the other thing is brain retraining, where you start teaching your amygdala and your limbic brain that, you know, if somebody says, well, you green eyed monster, um, that it recognizes this is not a, a threat. So we start to interpret threats differently, but this is something we need to practice. So the good news is with our limbic brain, everything that it's learned, it can also unlearn. And this is um, this is from neuroplasticity. We start to practice. For example, when you, you realize you're responding to something, you could say something like stop, stop, stop. And then interrupt that response and bring up like good memories or visualizations or you know there's there's a whole there's a like brain retraining is an actual thing you where you go through different steps to teach your brain to respond differently so this is yeah neuroplasticity and then you don't respond to threats anymore because maybe they're not even um, scary or dangerous or anything so i hope that makes sense tell me if it doesn't no, I totally made sense. It made sense to me. Anyway, I can't speak for yeah. Connie. <laughs> well, it makes sense, but it also sounds complicated. You know what I mean? It it, <laughs> it isn't takes time, definitely. Yes. <laughs> Luckily, it's not complicated, but it takes time and dedication. Yes. Like if you yeah. do one brain retraining round because you you respond to something like emotionally, 
that's not going to change your limbic brain to let go of its old ways. Yeah. I I did this for months, but um, after two, three months, I started seeing fantastic results. And after four months, I had my first symptom-free days. And I, I basically healed within four months, even after being ill for three years. So that's, that's amazing. It went. Do mm-hmm. you use um, like affirmations too? I know a lot of people talk about like affirmations to help mm-hmm. retrain your brain. Is that something you did or is it not something you utilized? It can be helpful at a later stage. Uh, oh my goodness. I tried to use affirmations uh, like 10 years ago and, you know, and manifestation and positive reinforcement and all those things. They did not work. Why? I, I always say that, uh, the, you know, um, uh, especially entrepreneurship is a nervous system game, not a mindset game. Everybody keeps talking about mindset. But, you know, uh, the limbic brain is our survival center and the limbic brain is one instance higher than our conscious thoughts. So this is so curious. Again, when our limbic brain is in survival mode, our prefrontal cortex that is in charge of, you know, rational thinking goes offline. So you can Mm -hmm. think all the way you want if you're in survival mode, it's it's it not going to work. Matter. Mm-hmm. No, see, that's very interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Also, why I for me, for example, I have barely any memories of my childhood, and that's also again, it's a protective mechanism. My hippocampus and my prefrontal cortex, especially my prefrontal cortex, went offline. Like I didn't store things like memories. Um, I have big chunks missing from my childhood. No idea. Yeah. So. I mean, that might kind of be a good thing. <laughs> yeah, <right? laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess it, it really is. Um, but to come back to affirmations, I use them a lot now, now that I'm out of survival mode. And I use them to saturate my brain, indeed. It's a fantastic tool um, to not go into fight, flight, freeze, or fawn again. So I have this affirmation, I'm safe, secure, and loved. So anytime I start to feel unsettled or scared or angry or whatever I I might I might just saturate like I I might sit there watching Netflix and say to myself I'm safe secure and loved safe secure and loved so I do that because otherwise that other shit takes hold you know the oh my god we're gonna die Mm -hmm. you know (laughs) so I I saturate my brain to not not go back into the dark to the dark side (laughs) yeah (laughs) I like the dark side. <laughs> I recently tried, and I'm probably, even though I lived in Hawaii for three years, I'm probably still going to say this wrong, but I tried the the whole ponu ponu, like where like you retrain wow. the self-love and all that. That is fantastic. Like I didn't mm-hmm. expect to feel like as good as I did just li- listening to something for a half hour. And like, I can't imagine how much better like it gets each time you listen to it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I love Ho'oponopono. I used to do that a lot as well. Um, but I couldn't crack into that true self-love and self-compassion that I have for myself now. So I think Ho'oponopono, again, is such a fantastic tool. And there's so many tools and, and pathways to regulate your nervous system and get your amygdala into safe space, you know, and uh, absolutely. So you know, I, I can't think of the other methods now, but there's so, so many pathways to, to that kind of getting into a calm rest and digest state. Absolutely. I love that. I love your rest and digest state. I like that. That's just very flowy. Yeah. (laughs) So I'm curious, what came first? Did you have to like go through basically like therapy before you could do the retraining? Or did you do the retraining like while doing therapy? Or like, like, what was the order? Like, would you do, would you recommend people do therapy first and then do the retraining? Or, you know, that's a Great question. So I started with going symptom crazy, which is not, I'm not saying this is how you should do it, but I'm just saying this is what (laughs) a lot of people experience. They have a symptom of like neck pain, back pain, and they go to their physiotherapist. Um, They have chronic pain and get a prescription drug. They, you know, they start to fix the sleep patterns. They start to, they try to you know, get the right medication for the autoimmune disease, which was for me was Hashimoto's. Um, they they start taking vitamins and uh, multi minerals and whatnot. Um, I used to, I changed my diet. I went gluten free, dairy free, um, soy free, um, nightshade free, like 
a kind of no fun free free <laughs> life. <laughs> yes. And to cut it short, it did not heal me. So we 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 zoom in on those symptoms and we never realize they all have one root cause, which is a dysregulated nervous system. Um, so like my healing journey started that, uh, that I was, I was hospitalized for a month. Um, and I, I really, I hit rock bottom and that was the only thing to do. I, I, um, I went to a psychosomatic clinic just to get some sense of, of like pain free and, and life. And like, I hope they could help me. And they did, they, they diagnosed me with CPTSD. So they diagnosed me with trauma. They diagnosed me with depression. They diagnosed me with anxiety. Um, so many other things. And, and they started to build me back up just by giving me love, care and attention. And, uh, so there was a little bit of therapy there, but, um, then once I left the clinic, I went into a self-guided um, course and, and study course. And um, that helped me regulate my nervous system somatically first. So this is what I would recommend. Learn somatic movement first um, to, to catch any kind of response, physical response you have and learn how to get your body back into rest and digest from whatever just triggered you. And um, because that builds capacity, you're building capacity in your nervous system to be able to handle more. Because I'm going to say this, if you start therapy and old trauma comes up, this is not something you do at the beginning because you do not have the capacity to begin with. So you need a very trauma aware therapist that knows not to send you out of your, your window of tolerance all the time. You need to stay. That makes sense. Yeah. You need to stay within your window of tolerance to begin with for your nervous system and limbic brain to calm down. So therapy for me comes later. So first okay. step, learn somatic movement to catch those responses that you have, uh, or even like, um, yeah, catch like, uh, like worries, fears. Like I had a lot of health anxiety. I, I was like, okay, next symptom. Is this going to kill me? Like I had so much fear in me <laughs> at that time. I like that. Is this going to kill me or is this going to kill me? Yeah. What will kill me? A bus, a plane. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then I started brain retraining to not respond to symptoms anymore as much. Um, and I have the perfect example. So I, I started brain retraining and I could feel sort of the first effects. I was much calmer. I didn't worry so much anymore. And uh, I sat there and I thought something was a bit off. So I measured my, my pulse, my heart rate, and my heart rate had dropped to 34 beats per minute. You know, your normal heart rate is like 60 to 90, whatever that, that range, 55 maybe. Yeah. And I sat there and I was like, hmm, my heart's not really beating much anymore. Am I dying? <laughs> oh my God. And I know. And then I, I checked in with my body. I'm like, but I feel fine. So I just didn't pay much attention to it. And I just, I was calm. I was like, it doesn't feel like I'm dying. So I'm good. You know, I'm not saying yeah. don't get medical attention if you need it. But I knew this was just another symptom my body was coming up with to, um, to alert me that things are not right. And I, I just, I was just like, doesn't feel dangerous to me. I'm fine. So that's brain retraining. You, you step out of that focus on symptoms and illness and 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 um yeah and all those anxieties and you step into you know what I choose the way I live my life and I choose not to worry right now so you are oh, you really get into the driver's seat with brain retraining and then therapy so yeah these Got three, three things mm. and that's why they call you Catherine Life Design because you're choosing <laughs> to change your life yeah what? Here I am, just pulling everything together. <laughs> I'm just yeah, kidding. believe me, I, I picked the name Life Design like 10 years ago because I'd always been obsessed with designing my life. Trust me, it did yeah. not feel yeah. like I was designing anything the last five years. Um, and I really thought, here I am, Catherine Life Design, bedridden and fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> Painful journey to come to, yeah, in terms of that. <laughs> Even imagine going from like 
yeah. being super sick and literally thinking you're going to die to mm. what you are now. That was a huge part. Um, I also changed, had to change my um, identity a lot. Like I call it adult main personality training or um, reparenting yourself and your nervous system. And the person that has come out of this is the person I always wanted to be. Let's let's be honest. And with I and with all my faults and flaws, I'm I'm not kidding. I have so much self compassion at this point in my life. I never knew that was possible. Like if if I mess up, if I fuck up, I I really know how to take care of myself and be there for myself and guide myself through mistakes. Through you know, I you know we all mess up every once in a while, but the yeah the person i've become I, i'm i'm actually really proud of of her because uh yeah she's not faking it anymore she's not mm -hmm. like trying to live up to who she thought she would be and ah uh, oh getting rid of all i can say is this getting rid of all your trauma responses and survival modes and, and survival mechanisms that you might not even know are there is one of the best things and most liberating things you'll ever do in your life do it Oh, makes me want to cry. Seriously, that's how how much that means to me. I want everyone to free themselves of that. So. I love that you touched <laughs> on all of that. Like all super important. Like learning to like love yourself and stop yourself. Like I think so many of us can relate to the fact that we get like we get on this roller coaster and we really quickly go downhill. Where you're like, what did yeah. you do? Why are you doing this? Why are you acting this way? Where where you, you just like you said, like step back and go, whoa you're you're okay calm down mm -hmm. everything's okay yeah. well and now with like social media and stuff it's really easy to get like overwhelmed or think that you're doing something wrong because you can see all the, these people that are living this shiny life and you're like wait my life doesn't look like that but then you don't realize well it's all for the camera hun yeah. you know you gotta exactly. take a step back and be like no mm -hmm. you're fine you're doing okay comparing is a huge trigger like uh, oh, if we yeah. start to compare ourselves like oh i'm not as far as i thought i should be and mm -hmm. oh it's horrible it's a horrible trigger yeah, yeah. And, and social media that's all that makes you do is compare if i could get rid of social media today i would but i have a podcast so i can't <laughs> We have a podcast, so we can't, I should say. Yeah. <laughs> and outsource it, I guess. <laughs> as yeah. much as we, we don't have the money for that, but <laughs> no, I, we blow up. <laughs> yeah. Now I definitely thought about um hiring somebody because um another thing that I don't think people talk about enough is like you just sometimes you don't have the capacity for everything. Like I do not have any more spoons. Like I don't have the capacity to do any more. Like my plate is Mm -hmm. so that's okay you need to, if you need to hire somebody you hire somebody if you need to yep. drop something you drop something like I think we get so caught up of thinking like I have to do this and I have to do this and I have to do this like no no you don't if your cup is mm -hmm. full you can say your cup is overflowing and yeah love it and, and feel that <laughs> feel that emotion because we we tend to intellectualize our emotion really feel what that feels like if the cup is full and like we it overwhelm like feel it's if it's too much and you can also ground yourself at the same time like really like feel that emotion of it's it's too much and at the same time touch something like touch anything and again, you're, you're, because your body is with you on that journey, you're actually, it's called grounding. And when you start to like, I'm, I'm touching the surface I'm sitting on right now and I can feel it's sort of texture, it's soft, you know. When we start to ground ourselves, then it's okay to handle that emotion of, of it being too much. That's how we get through difficult emotions a lot, a lot of the time, like with somatics, with, um, using our body to get into the present moment. And yeah, I, I used to try meditation a lot. It did not work for me. Like people say, oh, you know, just breathe, meditate a little bit, calm down. Uh, if you are in a fight or flight mode and you want to run away and you're like, we don't run away nowadays, but fl a flight mode might be something like, oh God, I want this to stop right now. I want this just to be gone. I wish this didn't happen. I don't want that that's flight and um 
so we can you know, where was going with this um yeah we can sort of use our body to get back into the the grounded space and what i was going to say is if you're in fight flight mode meditation is not the right tool for that moment so it, it takes awareness to know what to do in what moment um flight mode i might do something like walk between two walls and gently push against it and walk the other direction again. So you actually living the response that your body designed for you. But what we do most of the time, we sit in front of the computer and don't move at all, but feel horrible. So yeah. we need to take that response and even like anger. I live my anger nowadays and I do get angry, but I, I find very safe outlets for that. Um, but sitting there and meditating is not what to do in, when you're feeling frustrated or angry or any any of those yeah. emotions. Yeah. So well, yeah, what do they really... say now? They say what like sitting is the new cancer. So like they also scare people with that. Like get off your butt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel anyway, that. continue, Connie. As I said. <laughs> <laughs> what well, well, what I was gonna say is like. Um, I did a boxing class at, at my gym and like, I could definitely see how uh, like that like releases like pent up frustration. Cause I was, I was pissed off at my husband when I went because of some comment he made like right before I was like leaving. Yeah. And so then I hit the bag and no, I did not. Of course I didn't imagine his face. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> Let's admit it. <laughs> I I have moments I want to kill my husband like literally yeah. <laughs> but my um, FBI agent if you're listening it wasn't me <laughs> <laughs> no but finding safe outlets for what is already there like there's, there's no point in telling yourself to calm down there's no point in like oh you know get over it it wasn't so bad like yeah you need to physically, your body has already gone into the response of producing adrenaline, cortisol, like all the stress hormones. And if you do nothing physically, those stress hormones circulate in your system for hours. I I use um, jumping on, you know, like just jumping, uh, for example, to get a lot of adrenaline out of myself, like to, to mm -hmm. kind of get my body to calm down again, I jump. So yeah. there's a lot of safe ways to mitigate that response. So I'm just curious because, like, I started going to the gym, like, after I had my baby to basically, like, get out all of that, like, frustration and whatnot out at the gym. Do you think that is, like, a good way to, like, mitigate those responses for your body? Or, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, if you if you go to my website, actually, I, I wrote down my healing journey, and I say uh -huh. I credit five things with healing. First one, nervous system regulation. Second one, brain retraining. Third one, adult main personality or reparenting yourself. Um, adult adult main personality training. Fourth one, uh, weight training. I do a lot of weight training, and that's how I got rid of some of my final, my last symptoms, like uh, insulin resistance was going to be my next diagnosis, went down completely. So weight training was huge as well. And the fifth one was EMDR therapy, but there's also somatic experiencing as a therapy form that's also very successful. So those two therapy forms I recommend in, in, in the situation I was in, but everybody's a bit different. So those are the five things I credit with my healing. Indeed. So Jim, fantastic. Yeah. We nice. need to move the hormones and the responses that have been produced by our bodies. And yeah. I say all the time that the gym keeps me sane or exercising keeps oh, me God. sane. I know. I, yeah. I can't wait till uh, like cause we would go out on walks every morning and my son would eat his uh, breakfast in the uh, the stroller because otherwise he wouldn't want to ever be in the stroller it's neither here nor there but it's been super cold so i'm like i cannot wait to go back out and walk because it always makes me feel like more awake more alive before like going to work and sitting down for so long you know yeah, yeah i cannot wait to get back out there yeah and, it, and, and i can't do it on the treadmill because he would want to get on, on the treadmill mm -hmm. with me and it just does not work that way 
<laughs> that makes perfect sense from his point of view as well. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. No, because it's what not doing. He has yeah, to do. Yeah. And so I'd have to walk with him on the treadmill, which that's like, you're getting mm. too big for this. I can't do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, if there, there was something else? you could, oh. um, I have oh, one more. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Do you have something you could, oh no, you're fine. What's some advice, like if you could like give yourself as a teenager or a teenager now mm -hmm. that is dealing with narcissist and emotional abuse, what's something you wish you could tell your old self or tell teenagers that might currently be going through it? Hmm. Oh, that makes me want to cry when I see my little <laughs> 13 oh. or 14 oh. year old, um, I very often in therapy also wish that she didn't have to go through what she went through. I mean, of um, course. And, and I mean, this is true for many people, you know, this is not, I'm not in, this is an everyday thing. I'm not, I, I didn't experience like big T trauma or uh, sexual abuse or whatever, like that sometimes gets classified as, as huge trauma. I did not experience that luckily, but um we when when we go through emotional abuse it's so hidden yeah yeah and i i kind of oh, i wish yeah I don't, I don't even know what to say to my 13 year old self i wish i'd known that this was all orch orchestrated to make me really small and to re really strip away my sense of self and make me do whatever he wanted me to do and one thing was he always um so i was only good enough to be alive basically if I worked at the sawmill so I was basically forced to work at a sawmill um after school and whether it was you know minus 10 degrees or whether it was so this is this is um uh, celsius not fahrenheit sorry or if it was scorching hot in the sun it didn't matter you know I had to work in the sawmill to be valuable mm -hmm. and I wish I could tell her that she is valuable I know this sounds so cliche in so many ways but I wish she could feel that sense of, of value and, and self and uh and that she's okay the way she is I know that sounds so cliche but you have to feel it and I really do feel like if if I could have if I could instill that into her that even at 13 I I knew I felt something was off I knew I wasn't this wrong horrible person but feeling wrong, I took that all the way into my adulthood until I was 40, 42 years old. And, and this is such a huge factor in this is such a huge separation between all of us. Like if we start to feel we, we feel wrong often. I don't know how to put it. Yeah. Um, like starting to feel right in who you are is such a huge step in in also be having all this capacity to contribute to yourself and others I, I wish i didn't have to be in survival for that long anyway that was very yeah. um, unscripted nothing of this was in this interview is scripted but like i've never really <laughs> thought about what i would tell my 13 year old self yeah i don't know do you have any other advice for our listeners um, yeah, I would definitely check where your nervous system is at because we often don't realize um, what's going on with us um, and that all those different symptoms could be connected because we are dysregulated. Yeah. So I I always recommend to do the um, nervous system test. There's a there's a link on my website if you want to pack it into the show notes or oh, something. We will. Oh, yeah. absolutely, we will. Absolutely. Sounds good because that's that was my first step of realizing oh shit you know I'm I'm totally dysregulated and this could be the cause to so many of my problems. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming on our show. Thank you so much. You guys have it's a fantastic a show. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Deal when the shit gets real. Love it. <laughs> and now I'm thank gonna cry. So no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, thank you for coming on, and we will see everybody next episode.